Welcome to Mayo Clinic Sleep Medicine Podcasts, a series for physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, and other health practitioners treating sleep disorders or interested in learning about state-of-the-art advances in sleep medicine and sleep health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Silber. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Maitri Juna. We are both consultants at the Center for Sleep Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, we're going to be talking about the Z drugs, truths and myths for the clinician. Well, the search for a perfect hypnotic goes back centuries. Barbiturates dominated therapeutic choices in the first half of the 20th century, then In came the benzodiazepines from 1950s onwards, and each time initial enthusiasm waned with the discovery of side effects and addictive potentials. In the 21st century, the most commonly prescribed hypnotics are, I think, undoubtedly the benzodiazepine agonists, the so-called Z-drugs. Much is written about the potential dangers, but how much is real, how much is actually supported by data? My guest today is Dr. Banu Kola, Professor of Psychiatry at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science, and a physician who is board certified in both sleep medicine and in addiction medicine. So Banu, welcome. Let's Thank start, you. Let's start with an explanation of how these drugs work and which are available in the United States. Am I correct? They bind to the benzodiazepine receptor, but are not actually benzodiazepines in structure and that the available drugs have very variable half-life and therefore slightly different indications. Give us a brief summary of the drugs to start off the discussion. Sure. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Let me start off by thanking you for having me. So yes, these drugs, which are colloquially known as the Z drugs, because most of their names start with a Z or are pronounced with a Z, include Zolpidem or Ambien, S. Zopiclon uh, or Lunesta and Zaleplon or Sonata. They are technically what are called NBBRAs. So that stands for non benzodiazepine, benzodiazepine receptor agonists. So, like you said, they're not benzodiazepines, but they act on the benzodiazepine receptor and are roughly similar in terms of their mechanism of action. When they were first introduced, the idea was. These are less likely to cause some of the problems of the benzodiazepines. So benzodiazepines can also work as anxiolytics, muscle relaxants, and also have a bit of an addictive potential. And the idea was these would hopefully avoid all of those. And they do that to a degree at least. The half-lives are different. So Zolpidem or Ambien, which is the most commonly used, it roughly has a half-life of about two to three, sometimes maybe four hours. Esopiclone or Lunesta has a half-life of roughly eight. And Zaleplon or Sonata has a very short half-life of about one to two hours. So all of these drugs sort of have different lengths of action and therefore we use them for different reasons. The Zolpidem preparation also has uh, other formulations. So there is a particular formulation called intermezzo, which is a spray, and that uh, has a much quicker onset and potentially shorter duration of action, and there is a controlled release formulation as well. So all of them have different half-lives and therefore can be used for different uh, targets in terms of insomnia symptoms. Good. So a number of choices if one's going to use them. Are they are they dependence-producing? So yes, they are, but in general, that is extremely rare and much lower risk as compared to the benzodiazepines. And usually, at least in clinical practice and in some of the studies that have been done, the dependence tends to occur in the context of patients who have a history of an active substance use disorder, usually polysubstance use, so they're using multiple substances. Okay, well, Um, How effective are they? Is this the miracle eventual solution to all insomnia? (laughs) Yeah. Well, we hope they are, but they are not. Um, They are reasonably effective. 
So I think this has always been a debate. And um, when we look at meta-analytic studies, looking at what happens to objective sleep duration, we find that these drugs are effective, but depending on your perspective, you can argue that the uh, amount of time that they shorten sleep latency by is too short, roughly about 10 minutes on average. They increase the total sleep time by about 20 to 24 minutes on average, depending on the study. So the argument is that this is not much. But as you and I know, um, insomnia is a subjective disorder. So if the patient is experiencing difficulties falling, staying asleep, or unrefreshing sleep quality, that makes insomnia. And if you look at subjective reports, there is a clear indication that all of these medications improve subjective reports to a substantial degree. So they are effective for insomnia. Good. Now let's come to all these real or imagined side effects. First, do they increase the risk of falls at night and do they impair cognitive functioning, especially driving in the morning? Is this a real concern? Okay. So we'll take them both one, of, one at a time. So one is the risk of falls. So the one thing to remember here is that many, many medications, in fact, pretty much all psychotropic medications, including antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, and the Z drugs have all been shown to increase the risk of falls. There are also studies showing that insomnia by itself increases the risk of falls. Mm -hmm. So if you're not sleeping at night, you're likely to get up, move around. If you already have balance issues and there is poor light, that by itself will increase the risk of falls. But overall, there is a signal that with Z drugs, there is at least a slight increase in the risk of falling and this is especially true in the elderly. With falls, there is also a very slight increased risk of fractures. So like with any drugs, there are risks, there are benefits. So these are some of the risks that we consider. We educate the patients. We want them to make sure that there is nothing that is a trip hazard around the bed, make sure that there is a nightlight, and especially if there are particularly bad balance issues, want to weigh that when we are prescribing the medication. Mm -hmm. The second part the driving in the morning. And there have been some studies which have shown that when you take these medications, especially the longer acting formulations like Ezopiclone or Lunesta, there is a slight possibility that in the first one, two hours, you may be a little groggy. Of course, immediately after taking that, we always tell our patients no driving, no operating heavy machinery, nothing that requires them to pay attention, concentrate, and be alert. In the morning time, though, there have also been controlled studies looking at driving after taking the medication at nighttime, so after roughly eight hours. And the majority of the studies have found in the vast majority of patients, it's completely cleared out. It doesn't seem to interfere with their ability to drive. But of course, there can be a few outliers. So again, you're trying to deal with this clinically, having patients exercise some caution if they are finding that they are groggy to avoid driving immediately after taking it. Very sensible. So now let's talk about behaviors during the night, automatic behaviors in these drugs, sleep eating, sleepwalking, and some reports of sleep driving. In fact, I had somebody just last week who had one episode where she woke up in um, 10 minutes from her home in a car stopped by the side of the road. Um, how common are these things? How worried should we be about it? So... These are very dangerous and, in theory, life-threatening uh, side effects. So people can injure themselves or others when these occur. We don't know for sure how common they are. So there have been large retrospective studies looking at how often do patients report these. And when we look at those, the uh, reports seem to suggest it could be anywhere from 5 to 7 to 11%. For whatever reason, it tends to be a little more common with Zolpidem or Ambien as compared to the other two drugs, the Esopiclone, Lunesta, or Sonata Zaleplon. So they can occur. We don't know how frequently they occur, but in general tend to be rare. And this is actually a boxed warning that the FDA has put on pretty much all of these 
three drugs. So if they were to occur, the current recommendation is that the patient immediately stop the medication and contact you, uh, the prescriber. And in general, it's safer to avoid these medications once these complex behaviors have occurred. You also want to rule out if there is polypharmacy or other things that might be contributing to this as well. The the one the other thing for sleep eating with um, the Z drugs is restless legs, and there have been some mm -hmm. uh, nice studies suggesting that that combination can certainly sometimes convert um, conscious night eating when the person is wandering around with restless legs, unable to sleep, convert it to sleep related eating when they start taking the Z drugs. So that's an interesting sort of twist on these autom automatic behaviors. They're not Absolutely. all of them, of course, have restless legs. Right. And all of these drugs cause anterograde amnesia to a degree, so you forget what you're doing. So it might partly be that the, uh, that explain the complex behaviors. These are things you would have done anyway when you mm -hmm. have insomnia, and you end up doing them and don't recall having done them. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's go to dementia. What about dementia? Many patients I see say, I don't want to take these drugs. They, oh, they cause dementia. Um, is, is there any truth? What's, what's the science here? So this again is a very complicated question. So when we look at the data at this point, there have been a fair number of large cohort studies which have shown an association. So again, this is the key term here, an association between taking any of the Z drugs and over time an increased risk of developing or uh, having a diagnosis of dementia. So the question then becomes, is it causal? Are the drugs causing it? You have to balance this against other data which have clearly shown that insomnia is also a risk factor for developing dementia. So there are studies showing if you sleep poorly, you have increased risk. If you're on one of these drugs, you're maybe at increased risk. And tempering some of this, there actually has been a very recent study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, which I consider one of the better studies, which uh, looked at a Scandinavian, a Danish cohort, and compared uh, rates of dementia and those on the Z drugs versus those not, which showed that the risk actually was lower in those who were on Z drugs as compared to those who were not. So I think this is an unresolved question. I don't think there is convincing evidence that there is causality and also that insomnia by itself is a risk. So it's a discussion that you have with your patients. At this point, I tell them that the evidence is not convincing. And if there is reason for us to be prescribing these drugs, I wouldn't keep this theoretical risk at this time from us using these medications. That's a, that's a lovely summary of it. On another occasion, we should chat a little bit about why insomnia pre, may predispose or be associated with dementia, but that's a whole other subject. Well, let me give you a clinical scenario, which you know I come across every now and then. I'm referred a 75-year-old woman, but who's been taking five milligrams Zolpidem for 15 years. She now gets a new primary care physician who says, "What? Um, this is totally against the rules to use Zolpidem in an old person for chronic insomnia." The patient says, "I can't sleep without it. I've tried to come off a few times, and each time I, my horrible insomnia comes back." This has resolved the problem. It's been um, life-changing for me. I've got no side effects at all, no, tr no unsteadiness, no problems in the morning, no sleepwalking, etc. Um, and the primary care doctor says, well, you, you go see the sleep specialist. He's going to, he's going to tell you to get off it. Uh, what, how do you approach that problem? <laughs> well, I do, but I'd rather hear how an expert like you does. All right. Uh, this is not uncommon for me to, to see these patients. And uh, the first thing I think is to recognize that the primary care physician is coming from a point of concern and wants to do what's right by the patient. The scenario that you describe, I think, is relatively straightforward in that the five milligram dose for a woman is the correct FDA approved dose, that it is working well without any side effects, and that she has made attempts to go off and has been unsuccessful. So that makes the decision in this particular case quite easy in that 
if it is working, it's not causing any problems, I would say that it is okay to stay on it. This, the background to all of this is the initial recommendations for hypnotic medications have always said that these are short-term medications that you use for two, four, six weeks and get them off. But most of these were based off of studies that included barbiturates or benzodiazepines and did not take into account the Z drugs. There have now been many studies looking at azopiclone, ambient extended release, and even uh, zaleplon that have gone from six, 12 to 24 months and have found that these medications continue to remain effective. They don't cause any new side effects at that point. And insomnia, we know, is a chronic condition too. It can last in at least 50% of patients for at least five years. So this um, all needs to be weighed in. And at this point, I think that it is absolutely acceptable to stay on the medication as long as there are no new side effects. Patients have made good faith attempts to go off of it. And the insomnia is particularly burdensome when they go off the medication. Good. I've I've found in general that my older patients with their years of life experiences and maturity are so well suited to making these difficult decisions between benefits and risks. Mm -hmm. And it's it's often a pleasure discussing and hearing how they balance those ba those risks and things. And I, I really defer so much to their own judgment in many cases like this. I do too. Well. What final message can you leave with our listeners about the Z drugs? So uh, I think I'd want to sort of flag two things. One is the question often comes up, you have a patient who has sleep apnea and should they be taking a Z drug? This again is concern coming from the benzodiazepine or the barbiturate data where um, they are muscle relaxants. So we worry that they could potentially make sleep apnea worse. We don't have any convincing evidence that the Z drugs do that. And in fact, if we look at some of the studies with esopiclone, it may at least to a very minor degree, maybe clinically insignificant degree, improve sleep apnea. So they are perfectly safe to be using in patients with sleep apnea. The final thought is something that I was taught by one of my uh, psychiatrists about, my psychiatry teachers about benzodiazepines in that these are medications. All medications have risks have benefits. And with every clinical scenario, we're making a decision about whether the benefits overweigh the risks. And at that point, you're prescribing. So they're there for a reason. We use them for a reason. And we really need to make sure that we are not letting patients suffer unnecessarily when there is an answer and the benefits of the answer outweigh any potential risks. Well, that summarizes it just beautifully. Banu, Thank you so much for meeting, um, speaking with us today. Um, your wisdom in this is very much appreciated, and I hope our listeners have enjoyed this discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. It was an absolute pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please tune in again through wherever you receive your podcasts as we discuss further topics in sleep medicine and sleep health. Thank you. Thank you.